Good morning, and welcome to Neely's Creek Church, members, visitors alike. My name is Matt. I'm the pastor at Neely's Creek. In just a moment, I'll be calling us to worship, which is our primary purpose here together. But before I do that, I have a number of announcements to make. Now, some of you, or maybe even all of you, will know a good portion of these announcements. However, this is only the second of three services that we have today. The third one being online, and so we're going to make sure that all the announcements are available to that portion of our congregation as well. So those are these. Um, I don't know how many of you felt an earthquake a little earlier today, so I looked up some earthquake jokes. Um, (laughs) They are amazing. I just raised the bar way too high. But listen to this. What does the ground say to the earthquake? You crack me up. That's a pretty good one. And then this one's more of a one-liner. So it wasn't that big of an earthquake. Therefore, nobody was hurt, which is a good thing. But a few snakes were rattled. Thank you, Trent. We didn't even practice that. That was good. Okay. Uh, Then, also now, announcements. Normally during the month of August, we would have a day that we would call homecoming. That kind of speaks for itself. So we have uh, made the decision that this year would not be a good year to hold homecoming. Thus, we are already looking forward and praying that we will be able to have a homecoming at a later date, um, probably next year. Also, what is consistently being reviewed by your church leaders is how are we going to be doing this church life thing going forward. This is our main component, worship, but we know that church life has a lot of other components that right now are either happening in a much different way or not happening at all, and we're waiting for them as well. So thank you to everybody who contributed with uh, ideas, thoughts, time, extra meetings, etc., Basically, we're holding for a while, just so you know. Of course, we'll keep you posted, but we will have an 8.30 service in the gymnasium, 11 o'clock service here, and the third service will be a recorded service online. So that's just where we are. Again, we'll keep you posted. One exception, and that has been given to us, granted by the deacons. There are a number of committees that are associated with church. Church members know this all too well. Those committees perform some pretty essential functions that need to carry on regardless. Thus, it helps to meet. And sometimes online either doesn't work very well or doesn't work at all. So I'm speaking um, to the chairman of committees primarily in here, by extension, anybody who's on one. The social hall, which is the building adjacent on this side, my right, your left, The deacons have opened to committees if their chairman would so choose to meet in person. Understanding, number one, that social distancing will still take place. And the deacons, I presume, thought that's a big enough area for a committee to, you know, give themselves elbow room and then some. And then chairmen are responsible to disinfect that building. Whether that's them, whether they put a team together, whether they just make sure it's done somehow, it's it's the responsibility of the chairman to disinfect that room afterward if you choose to use it. Got it? One tip there. Number of us have been in on the disinfection process in this room, for example, uh, amongst others. And so this note from the deacons, again, chairman, hopefully you've done this. If you haven't, find myself or a deacon, they'll let you know what I'm talking about. Um, There's this spray, and it goes on, and it needs to stay there for 10 minutes. By the way, if you've been a part of this, I'm pointing my finger at you a little bit. If you're people who are wanting to hear what's going on in here when you're not in here, and we're trying to get, like, elders to clean the room, okay. Gentlemen, here's the plan. We're starting here. You're starting there. We're covering it all, and then we're going to wait 10 minutes. Do you know what the hardest part of that job is? Waiting 10 minutes. Even when it's me, I used to think that I had some sort of an influence around here. That's gone a little bit by the wayside. Like, I got the clock. You can start wiping down in 10 minutes. I'll tell you when it's 10 minutes. Stop wiping down. (laughs) Back up. 
It's been like a half an hour. No, it's been six minutes. We need to wait four more minutes. Men need to stand here and think of something to talk about. That's tough work. All right, all that to say, if you're a chairman and you are doing this disinfecting or you have your team of disinfectors using the provided disinfection uh, spray, there's a red, uh, is that a microfiber rag? Mike got the nod, microfiber rag, the red. They need to be moistened when you're doing your wiping up. And I see a lot of eyebrows going, okay. So there you go. There's your conditions. There's your exception. In the meantime, we remain as we were as a church going forward. Now, uh, we still need a nursery worker. We're praying that that time comes soon when the children's ministries are once again unleashed and we have more children by far than we did when we started this COVID-19 thing, and specifically the nursery type folk. So uh, be aware that that is a need, and it's good of us to keep aware of that even when at the moment we have nowhere to actually put that person to work. Um, We still need them. (sighs) I am now going to call us to worship. I have the privilege to do that, and I am going to use Verses 6 through 9 of Isaiah chapter 25 to call us to worship and we will let God's word speak for itself and direct us as his Holy Spirit carries it forward. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food, full of marrow, of aged wine, well-refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Thus we are promised. Thus we are also directed. As we enter into worship, pray with me. Father, I do pray that you, by your Spirit, would grant unto us, would sustain within us, would cause to bubble up from us the joy that is our salvation, but more, the joy that comes from the salvation that comes from our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we now appear before you in worship as your own, in whose name we now pray. Father, be with us by your word, by your spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. It's not a requirement. It's an invitation. And as we continue in worship, here's what we're going to do. We're going to spend a little more time in prayer together. Then we're going to have a time of the reading of God's Word, and then we're going to have a sermon. So those are our next few stops, and I would ask then that you would pray with me. Let's pray. Father, once again, this is your day, and in your Word you have instructed that we are to rejoice and be glad in it. And immediately our eyes are drawn to all of the difficulties, all of the troubles, all of the fears, and Lord, to Christ's cross and to your word, which tells us that in the midst of everything, even the mountains falling into the heart of the sea, we will not be afraid. We do have that in which we can and even must rejoice in. And that is you. And that is our salvation provided by you. Lord, we are incredibly humbled and incredibly grateful and certainly joyful as we are those who gather in Jesus' name as your people 
who have an unfailing hope, who have a confidence, who have an assurance of this salvation, this grace, this mercy, this love, and thus, Father, we can and we must confess to you our sin. Elsewhere in your word, you make it known that when we sin, we sin against you. And when we contemplate Christ's cross, we recognize that the penalty for that sin has been paid. So, Father, we would not here in your house on your day as your people think to hold on to sin, to harbor it, to give it a new name, to try to dress it up and make it acceptable or shiny. Father, let us call sin what it is. And where we are resistant to do that, Father, break our resistance for our good and for your glory. Lord, would you by your Spirit assist us now in the quiet of our hearts to silently confess unto you our sin. Father, in all of the many distractions that life has for us at every turn, for all of its noise, for all of its raucous behavior, we might yearn for silence, for quiet, for solitude, but when it's this kind of silence, Lord, when it is a purposeful, pregnant silence of confession, Father, in our wayward hearts, we would ask for the clamor. We would ask for a distraction, not just so we could take our eyes off of our shortcomings, but so that you would take your eyes off of our shortcomings, that we wouldn't be held under your high and holy gaze a moment longer, that we could avoid that for all time. But Father, we know that that is a fool's errand, even of the mind, even of the heart. For you see all, and you are eternal, so you see all eternally. Father, you know the burden that sin presses upon us, and you know that we cannot carry it, nor can we pay the penalty for having committed it. And so would you have us here in this time together, and even looking at one another in our mind's eyes, see that all of us, contemplating Christ, his cross, his resurrection, and having pronounced faith in his name, stand before you forgiven. So, Father, may there be even two or three in this room gathered in Jesus' name. May there be even more. And may we know each one that we stand before you spot-free, forgiven, blemish-free, made holy, righteous, acceptable unto you. And may we know that of the others as well. Father, may this work against our pride and may this work to instill in us a humility that is felt, that is shown, that is known not only to ourselves but by others in the way that we speak, in the way that we carry ourselves, in the way that we are quick to serve one another because we have become so aware of how we have been served, how we have been saved. So, Father, conform us more, even now, during this time of prayer, during this worship, during this day, conform us more into Christ's image as we bear his name, that we would think like him and talk like him and act like him. Father, in that respect and having the assurance of salvation, we may and must and do approach you boldly in prayer. And you have situated us around a number who are some family, who are some friends, who are some Christians, who are some not. But we have the privilege of serving by bringing them to your attention in prayer. And though there are many, we will pray for here together a representative few. Lord, we have been praying for those who have either been through a procedure physically, medically, or have been anticipating one. And so we thank you for your faithfulness in the life of Mary Jan, for carrying her through her surgery safely, that it was successful. Lord, as there have been some hiccups in recovery, I pray that she would be protected and that her recovery would be uh, swift, complete, uncomplicated. 
Lord, we praise and thank you for your work in the life, the body also of Jerry Williams and Judy Hinson. We pray for the health of David, her husband. And then, Lord, for Kathy and Olivia and Robin and Eddie, who are in the wake of having some rather pronounced things take place in their bodies. I pray that they know that you are with them. You have never left them. You will always be with them, that they have nothing to fear. But I pray there on their behalf here that they would be restored to health, that they would, that they would be made whole. I pray for Heidi as well. Or there are those who have suffered loss. And so this morning we do remember the Shirley family who has suffered great loss and in short succession. So Father, I pray that your comfort would be amplified in that family and in the lives of those who are left here to mourn and to hope at once. Father, would you grant that? Not just the ability to mourn and mourn appropriately, but to mourn as those who have hope. And in the coming weeks and months and years, Father, I pray that the gospel only shines brighter and that it would continue to go forward. Father, we do thank you for families. We thank you for the late arrivals or the arrivals of late, specifically for Henson Holder. Thank you that you have watched over him from his first day and you've seen him since before time. And now we get to see him, your handiwork, and we thank you for him and pray for his family. Pray for the families that have also welcomed young ones this year, for those who are expecting that you would watch over those who are on the way, that you would protect them as you continue to knit them together. And for all of the unborn, Father, we pray that you would operate, that you would act through your people, that they would be treasured, recognized as made in your image, preserved, given life. Father, for our families, I thank you for safe passage of the Fairbairns away from here and to their new home. I ask for uh, your blessing upon them as we hurt having lost them, but knowing that they are still active and working in your kingdom where you would have them, we rejoice and ask that you would bless them in their new, uh, new home, their new area, their new ministries, their new avenues. Lord, for our families and for Christian families, I pray that you would strengthen that bond of marriage that you have put together. And when the stresses come and the strains come, be they physical or financial or relational, when they come, that the marriages of those who belong to you would find themselves equipped with greater strength, that the tensile strength of these marriages is capable of withstanding far more than any would hope to have to withstand or that any would think could be withstood. Father, this can only come from you, and we pray that it does. And not just so that we would have families that are protected from Satan's effort to dissemble anything that you have assembled. Father, may we find that love flows in that bond and faithfulness and trust and gentleness and an excitement to be able to serve one so closely and daily. Lord, I pray that the families by extension would be blessed and this isn't so that we can judge other families or hold ourselves in some high respect over other families, but no, Lord, that the Christian family would shine as a light, that it would be as salt in this world that has great difficulty with commitment and with union and may our marriages, may our families' lives show your commitment to us. And you're having taken pains and paid a great price to have us commune with you, made one. Father, bless that bedrock fabric of society, the family, and where it is upon us to participate in that. Direct us, humble us, energize us. Lord, that we from that position would be able to reach out to others who are without whether it be finances or family or maybe even friends that we would be reaching out from a position of strength and that strength would be granted wholly by you to be used by us for your glory. Beyond the family, Father, I pray then for the society that is comprised of families. Individuals to be sure, I pray that those who are governed 
would understand that we and those who govern us all are accountable to you only in the end forever. And thus, I pray that for those who are governed and those who govern, we would be gripped by a right and proper fear of the Lord, that we would be concerned with your will being done on earth as it is in heaven, that we would be concerned to stand in the way of that which is not your will being done on earth as it is not ever going to be done in heaven. Father, I thank you for putting your church here and counting us an active agent in your kingdom even now. So Lord, would you, would you bless and bless mightily, I pray. Would there be unity evident in our churches, in our families, even within our own hearts? And may it be contagious as we put forward then, uh, again, that gospel light. Lord, I ask that this COVID virus would be on its way out, that you would show mercy particularly to the poor, Poor people in this nation, poor people in this world, poor countries in this world. Father, please, I beg you that if there is correction that needs to take place because of this, that that correction would take place and take hold and be evident soon, soon enough that this could, this could abate. It's for their sake and it's for your glory that I pray. May we, like Christ did for us, empty ourselves and be ready to do so as you direct. For all that we have, including our breath, including our very life, is a gift. May we be good stewards of it. These things that we pray this morning out loud, these things that have been prayed silently, these prayers that will be made today and in the days to come, all of these, Lord, all of these, Father, we make in Jesus unmatchable name. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. So we turn now to God's Word. We are in a sermon series. That sermon series is in the Gospel of John. John is the fourth book in the New Testament, the first four books of the New Testament, all four of them being the Gospels. We come to chapter 2 this week. We'll go through the first 12 verses together this morning. And then for next week, if you are one who likes to work ahead, it will be the remainder of the chapter. So verse 13 through verse 25 for next week. This is God's Word. It is holy. That means set apart. It is inspired. That means God breathed. It is infallible. It means it does not fail, nor will it. John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to this wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first. And when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples and they stayed there for a few days. Here ends the reading of God's word. 
and may it be a blessing to his people. There are a number of key things in this passage that we cannot escape, must not escape, and if we're going to make sense of the book of John in the future, whether it's a personal study, whether it's for future sermons, um, whatever it is, we don't want to miss these key points, and so I trust uh, that we won't. Let me give them to you at the front end. Uh, One is sign. That is going to be coming over and over and over again. This is the first sign. And then the other one is hour. We're given a little preliminary taste when Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. It's not picked up again in this passage. Thus, we should be looking forward to what does he even mean? And what does it mean when his hour does come? So I would again encourage you, if you have read this book in its entirety, it's not long, you bumped into that and you know when the hour comes. If you've already read it, I would say read it again. If you've never read it, I'd say read it and have your eyes peeled, your ears perhaps then peeled if you're listening, to the hour and to signs. One other thing I think I need to lay out beforehand, and that has to do with wine, which is a very powerful symbol in the Bible throughout Old Testament, New Testament. And very briefly, it generally symbolizes, or rather almost universally symbolizes, two things. One, the abundance of life that will mark the coming kingdom that all of the prophets prophesied. Wine is one of the markers of the kingdom coming, the anticipated kingdom coming. And of course, a kingdom can't come without its king, and thus there is an anticipation for this king. And when this king comes, he will usher in a life that is so rich and so abundant and does in fact include wine that flows the richest and the most abundant way. If you heard that in Isaiah 25 when we were called to worship, that's the plan, and he's the one who will work this, and this is an indicator of it. And so the people have been looking for this king for quite some time and looking for this new life for quite some time, and it is represented in wine. Wine also in the Old Testament particularly connotes joy. And we can understand, I think, in part, why wine would be associated with joy, with good feelings, with mirth, with gladness. And that's appropriate. And so that is how it is put forward in God's Word. And these things help when we bump into Jesus at a wedding producing wine, miraculously. Um, Drunkenness, however, is universally in the Bible frowned upon. It is looked down upon. It is not promoted. It is not something that is fitting. That would be something that would be wrong and recognized in the Bible as wrong. So there you go. We've got wine. We know how wine works. We know what it symbolizes, and we know that drunkenness is off limits. For those of you who might think, yeah, oh, okay. Now, we're going to a wedding. I think that probably all of us have been to a wedding, maybe. Let's just presume that most of us, at least, have been to weddings. Context is important. We're already set now in the context of the Old Testament, some prophecies, some things that the Old Testament has already made known regarding wine. That helps. Well, we're going to a wedding. What is the context of wedding? Is that important? Is that significant? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, it is. What do weddings generally signify? A new beginning. That's right. They should. They're supposed to. How could they not? It's a new beginning. And we love them. Why? Partly because we love new beginnings. Why? Because it could be that some of us might really, really like a new beginning. That we are in a place that we'd rather not be. It could be because of our own actions. It could be because of the actions of others. It's probably an interplay. A new beginning would be really nice. Is there such a thing? Well, listen on. What else do weddings normally carry with them and thus cause us to like them oh so much? Joy, right? 
mirth, gladness, fullness. It's no accident that Jesus performs this first sign at a wedding, indicating new beginning, joy, mirth, abundance, fullness, future. So if you are one who has at any point felt like that would be something that would be satisfying to you, then you are looking for the same person that the people of old, specifically the people of Israel, had been looking for for centuries. You are looking for the coming king. And there's only one. And this coming king will be recognizable. And the way he'll be recognizable is because in accordance with God's word, he will provide what God promised that he himself, God himself would provide. So this one would be not only king, but an agent of God. And not only king, an agent of God, but God himself. And he would need to be revealed then to us if he were ever to come on the scene. Chapter 1 of John made it clear already that John came in order to proclaim him, to bear witness to him, this one who's coming into the world, who is the light of life, who is the life of men. And then at the end of chapter 1, that's exactly what John did, and his own disciples start following after Jesus. And here's where we pick up today. If you were here last week, or if you've read the book before, then you know that the last disciple before this, in chapter 1, that was gathered to Jesus is named Nathaniel. And Nathanael is astounded by Jesus because Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree. When Jesus was nowhere in the vicinity of said fig tree. And so this was a remarkable something to say the least. And Nathanael says, you are the king of Israel. I recognize you. You are, you are the son of God. I recognize you. And Jesus answers him. This is verse 50 of chapter 1, and this is why it's significant as our context to get into where we are at the wedding now today. Jesus says, because I said I saw you under the fig tree, you believe? You'll see greater things than these. Oh, hallelujah. You'll see greater things than these. And when he says you, it's plural. Everybody, everybody who's going to follow Jesus, everybody who's ever going to listen to Jesus, he speaks loudly, boldly, clearly to all of history, to all of the future, to all of time. You will see greater things than these. I promise. Whew. All right, so now we're three days later. That's verse 1, chapter 2 here. And where are we? We're in Cana, in Galilee. Would you like to know where Nathaniel's from? Do you think you might be able to guess where Nathaniel's from? Nathaniel's from Cana in Galilee. You want to know what city's kind of nearby Cana? It's one you may have heard about before. It's called Nazareth. You know who's from Nazareth? Jesus. There's the homecoming. We're coming home. We're coming to the people whose names we know. We're coming to the place where we use first names to address people. And we're coming to a wedding. Now, Mary is there. She's not named in this gospel at all. She's called the mother of Jesus. Jesus doesn't use her name. He uses the term woman. We'll deal with that in just a moment, I promise. Apparently, she's involved in this wedding. And you guys get it. A number of us have been involved in a number of weddings in this church in this year. We're anticipating others. And we're involved. And we share this joy and we share this hope and we love the new beginning and we understand how wedding celebrations go and, and Mary's somehow in the mix here. And they run out of wine. Let's just say for now, for the sake of time, big faux pas, big, huge telling of what it is that we can produce. Telling then for what it is that Jesus then does produce. But at any rate, they run out, Mary, could be involved with a wedding. Comes to Jesus, who she's known, certainly. Learned to trust, certainly. At this point, we think Joseph is dead and has been probably for quite some time. And Jesus is the firstborn, so he's probably been taking care of the family. He's probably a good caretaker. If you can imagine anything else, then you don't know Jesus. And so she tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. Before moving on to what the sermon, I'm sorry, the servants do, and Jesus calls her woman. What's happening here? Jesus is beginning his public ministry. The revelation of God among men is beginning. 
And it's beginning here. And it isn't because his mom told him to do a thing. It isn't because he's beholden to his mother. And we need to see this very carefully. And it's seen, or heard rather, in this word woman. Because as soon as Jesus enters into actively his public mission of making known the Son of God, he himself, everything is subject not only to the mission, but to him. And so when he says woman, it isn't a derogatory term. It isn't dismissive. It isn't mean. It isn't mean-spirited. It's full of tenderness. It's full of the requisite respect for any who would think, I'm not going to follow Jesus. He doesn't respect his mother. Full of respect. He says, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Some hour has come, obviously, but an hour Jesus is talking about is being foreshadowed. It hasn't come yet. I don't know if you know the story about Mary and Joseph bringing Jesus to the temple. This is another one of the Gospels. And Simeon, the priest, who's very old, receives them. God has told him, you'll see the Christ child. And indeed he does. And he's holding the Christ child and he's making some prophecies regarding this Christ child. And one of them concerns Mary. And he says, a sword will pierce your heart meaning you will suffer great pain on account of this one, your firstborn son, who is the Son of God. And I wonder if some level of that pain was felt in that moment when Jesus didn't call her mother. He called her woman, meaning I'm stepping forward and family ties now must subject themselves to me and who I am and my mission and my coming kingdom And I wonder if for any Christian in here or group of Christians or family maybe even of Christians if God is so blessed, if that same pain or an echo of it hasn't been noticed by you at some point. That even family ties need to be subject to Christ's call. And if you're subject to Christ, that means you will obey him. Mary takes it in stride. She doesn't lose any faith whatsoever in Jesus. She instructs the servants, you do whatever this man says. He's trustworthy, he's good, and he'll do something. I don't know what, he'll do something. Okay, so there's the hour. That's all we're going to get this morning about the hour. And we're working our way towards sign, and we're making our way there by way of these six stone jars, big ones. There's some good news here. And you're like, why? What's good news about six stone jars? The good news is that the six stone jars are explained to us. Okay, great. Why is that good news? That's good news because anybody who grew up Jewish would know exactly what those six stone jars were for. Anybody who wasn't raised Jewish would have no idea what those six stone jars were for. Thus, this gospel was written for Gentiles. What's a Gentile? Anybody who wasn't raised Jewish. Well, what's the good news there? The good news is that the gospel is for Jew and Gentile alike and that God would make sure that everybody understands who's on the scene right here. This is a wedding like no other. Weddings are great, but this has one in attendance who was there at the beginning, who was there at the first wedding, who will be there at the final wedding. It's Jesus. Who is he? Well, he's being revealed to us. So let's proceed. What were these stone jars for? It says the Jewish purification rites. And that just lets us all know, whether we knew it or not, that the Jews were very strictly religious. They had a strict religious order. And they had observances that they needed to repeat at the right time, in the right way, all the time. And it was external And so these six stone jars would be used for cleansing the Jews' understanding that there is impurity, and impurity needs to be done away with, certainly on the external, also of the heart. But we can only operate on the external, and therefore, when we have utensils, we wash them. When we come to a gathering, we wash our hands. We understand that medicinally. They would understand that perhaps somewhat medicinally, but certainly symbolically. We need to be made clean. What does Jesus say then about these stone jars that are huge? He says, fill them up and fill them to the brim. Now, what, if any, significance does that have? 
Those six stone jars stand for the entire Jewish religious system. And Jesus is in effect saying, its service has been rendered. Its service has been rendered in full. Its service is now complete. And its service has been found lacking. Something new is coming. There is a new beginning that will far surpass that which was before and will provide what that system could not. All the system of the law could do was condemn and hold accountable and pronounce guilty and failed and flawed and dirty. What is to come is going to provide life and life abundant how do we see that? Okay. Well, Jesus tells the servants to bring the water to the master of ceremonies. My word, that's a good way for us to understand it. Let me say a word about master of ceremonies or maybe wedding planner if you prefer. Here's the thing about them. And we have one or two in the room right now, wedding planners. Well, that's their job. And anybody who has a job and is good at their job knows their stuff. What's the stuff that a wedding planner or a master of ceremonies would need to know about? Well, they'd need to know about color combinations. They'd need to know about seating arrangements. They'd need to know about getting the word out, communications, right? They'd need to know about who to hire, who not to hire. They'd need to know about where to get the goods, where to get the stuff, where to get the cake, where to get the meal, where to get the wine. Where to get the band, where to get the music, what music to play. This is the job. Presumably they're good at their job or they wouldn't have it. I know that many of you have been involved in the weddings as of late. And I know that therefore many of you have gone to the tastings so that you can discern between good and better. Between better and best. And then hold that up against the price list and say, yeah, good, good, good is good. The job of the master of ceremonies, the job of the wedding planner is to know what's best. And if best can't be had, all right, to know what's next best, et cetera, et cetera. When the master of ceremonies tastes this wine, he is absolutely baffled because it is of the most supreme quality. It is a premier wine, and little does he know, there are gallons upon gallons upon gallons of it just outside. Now, what do you and I know about good wine? Whether we drink or don't drink, whether we buy wine or don't buy wine, probably we've been in stores that sell it. And even if we had the fleeting thought of, I think I might buy a very nice bottle of wine, or I wonder what other people buy when they buy nice bottles of wine, we realize, oh, wow. Well, they lock it up. I had to get a manager to even get my hands on it, let alone wonder if I could afford it. That's what good wine is. And that's why this master of ceremonies has his mind blown. Because not only is it that high of a caliber of wine, not only does it so far surpass what was available beforehand, but it is the reverse of what everyone else does. You put the good forward first, and then when people become less discerning because they've been partaking of it, then you give them the, the cheap stuff. This man has no category for how the wine is there, what kind of wine it is, or why it came at this time. Here's another neat thing. Most of the people at the party have no idea that anything's happened. It's just normal. It's to be expected. Only a few understand that something of cataclysmic importance has taken place. And those who would have had eyes to see, and those who would have had eyes to hear, and who are waiting for this coming kingdom, and who are waiting for this coming king, and who are desperate for a new beginning, and who have had lives that are lifeless, who have had lives that are not satisfactory, even though they're filled to the brim, they're not life-giving. For those who would yearn for the kingdom and more than that, for the king of this kingdom. At least in verse 11, we understand this. And his disciples saw this, the first of his signs, 
he keeping his word that they would see greater things than this. This is just the beginning. This is just number one. There's six more on the way. They see one who at least in this moment is clearly Lord over creation and there's only one of those who is performing things before their very eyes for the joy and for the life and for the fulfillness and the happiness of his people, even if they don't know that it's he who's doing it, they see somebody who is operating tangibly, real time, as the coming king is supposed to operate, and only the coming king could. And they believe in him. And it's a new beginning. And their old lives, whatever they were before, fall away. It doesn't mean that they now avoid pain and struggle and hardship. Oh no, that'll most likely increase. And by the end for all of them, it absolutely does increase. But the quality of their life, the fullness of their life, and not just this one, but eternally, is abundant. There is a joy there that is irrevocable. It can't be taken away, can't be stamped out, can't be snuffed out, can't be stolen, can't be put down. Why? Because it's Jesus' life. And that can't be put down, that can't be stamped out, that can't be put away, Satan tried. All of mankind represented in that governor and those soldiers that nailed him to the cross. It's a colossal failure. And the greatest sign was yet to come and that was his being resurrected from the dead. He's Lord of creation, he's Lord of life. And he has come to give it abundantly. So if you are one, who thinks that your life has only known or at least has recently known or at this moment now knows an emptiness, a joylessness? Could it be that God in his mercy already knows that about you and is doing you the service of making sure that you once again behold his son? If he is your Savior, then as your Savior. If he isn't, then as the Savior. Such that we would find satisfaction. And a satisfaction that comes with joy and fullness no matter what. One last comment and then we're done. But the comment is this. Many of us tend to associate happiness with Christianity. And it isn't absolved from Christianity. If you're a Christian, you don't suddenly become an unhappy person. And you don't suddenly become an only happy person. You know that. And the folks who've been Christians longest know that best of all. So when we think that in order to be Christian, we must be happy, and if we don't have happiness, then we would naturally think then we can't be Christian. Those two have to go together. That's a falsehood. It's not true. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us this world will have its share until the end of disease and warfare and treachery, and we know it. And we can't be happy about these things, and we mustn't be happy about these things. And if you are happy about these things, come see me, and I need to find you a counselor. We mustn't be happy about these things. Sickness, death, loss, financial ruin, divorce. These are not things to be happy about. And then you wonder if I have just discounted the entire sermon, which was based on God's word, did I just discount God's word? Because here we're talking about joy. And I'll tell you this, joy and Christianity go together and they're inseparable. Joy and suffering can go together. Happiness might not be there. But because we have a hope and a sure and certain hope, we have joy. That joy isn't and mustn't and can't and won't go away. There is a distinction between joy and happiness. Joy lasts. It is an eternal, permanent something. Happiness comes and goes. And in Jesus, we have Jesus. If we have Jesus, we have joy because he gives life, and this is the kind of life he gives. 
He doesn't pretend. He doesn't tell half-truths. And if he says he's going to provide something, I promise you, he'll provide it, and he'll provide it in full. This is the first of the signs that Jesus performed in Cana in Galilee. John 20, verse 30 tells us this. These signs are written in this book that you might believe, and in believing, have life in his name. So for those who do believe, may that faith be strengthened. For those who do not yet believe, perhaps the call is there today, and today's the day to answer it. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for again showing us our abject need for you, and that you are one who will provide us with what we need And as you have seen fit to provide joy and abundance and mirth and happiness and gladness and security and peace forever in Jesus, may we be marked by these things, Lord, despite the circumstances that others might see in fact where our hope is found and that it is found squarely and eternally in Jesus, in whose name we live and breathe, and in whose name we pray. Amen. Um, As we close, we have one more song for us to sing together as God's people. Uh, Wine also in the Bible throughout Old Testament, New Testament signifies one other thing, and that's life. Why? Because it's red like blood. And blood is where life is found in the ancient understanding. If you lose all your blood, you lose your life. If you don't lose all your blood, you have your life. And so part of the Jewish ritual was ritual sacrifice all the time. Every day, morning, evening, holidays, weekends, sacrifices. Why? Because the people needed purification. From what? Sin. What's the penalty for sin? Death. Why are the people spared to be able to continue to worship? Because some blood was spilt before they entered the building. It was of that goat or that ram or that ox or that lamb. Life needed to be given in order to purchase the lives of sinners and all of the sacrifices that mankind could provide for all of the centuries was insufficient, was full to the brim and found lacking. But there was one. There was one that was acceptable to God and was, in fact, provided by God. And in John chapter 1, was identified as the Lamb of God, meaning Jesus. See him there, the great I am, a crown of thorns upon his head, the Father's heart displayed for us, oh God, we thank you. Lifted up on Calvary's hill, we curse your name, but even still, you bore our shame and paid the cost. Oh God, we thank you for. Behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on His hands. Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. We see.
Jesus, you will reign forevermore. The victory is yours. Offer up this sacrifice for every sin our Savior died. But the Lord of Contained. Oh, our God is risen from the grave. Oh, our God has risen from the grave. Oh, behold the Lamb, the story of redemption written on. So his word is reserved for the words then of Jesus. They're found here at the end of a different gospel, the gospel of Matthew. And so for the people of God, receive now the benediction. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you, always, to the end of the age. Amen. Amen.